Hello and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Memo's Week Review Show with me, Nassim Ahmed. I am joined by our regular guest, Moin Robbani. On today's show, we will be discussing the latest from Gaza, a regional escalation from Israel's war on the besieged enclave uh, with news from Friday, US bombing targets in Syria and Iraq. We'll also be looking at President Biden's executive order targeting Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank. Uh, we'll be asking how significant is that? Uh, UK could recognize a Palestinian state. That's what um, our foreign minister, what UK foreign minister David Cameron has said. What's that all about? And uh, we've also seen over the week growing opposition to the Israeli war with hundreds of civil servants signing letters of protest and staff at CNN appalled by uh, it's, uh, the agency's spreading of Israeli propaganda. So we're looking at the media fallout as well. Um, but let's begin with, with Gaza, Moin. Let's start with, uh, well, first of all, um, the, the death toll has surpassed 27,000. Uh, further 66,000 have been injured, the majority of whom are women and children, a trend uh, that has continued from day one of Israel's bombing campaign. And aid to Gaza that we heard this week is at risk of collapse due to funding cuts on Anarwa. We have a lot to say about Anarwa and how this is turning out to be a, a huge scandal. Uh, but let's begin with um, the actual events on the ground. Have you seen anything, any evidence to suggest that Israel has taken the ruling by the International Court of Justice seriously? Uh, the killing has continued more or less at the same rate, and there's no sign of it uh, stopping. None whatsoever, um, whether in terms of actions or statements. In terms of actions, what Israel is doing in the Gaza Strip is entirely indistinguishable from what it was doing in the Gaza Strip on the eve um, of the International Court of Justice's ruling. This This applies whether... We're um, referring to um, the bombings and mass killings of civilians in the Gaza Strip, including entire families composed primarily of children being wiped out um, by Air Force raids or artillery shellings. Um, this applies to the systematic raising of infrastructure, of homes, of buildings, and so on, in controlled demolitions where there is absolutely no pretext of any um, uh, military advantage, simply for the sake of um, destroying these areas and making them uninhabitable for Palestinians. And of course, this applies to um, the engineered famine, particularly in the Northern Gaza Strip and um, the continued prohibition on the entry of um, uh, proper volumes of urgently required um, life-saving goods uh, to the Gaza Strip, whether um, uh, food, water, um, medical supplies, uh, electricity, and the like. And um, multiple organizations have warned that at this rate, we will soon be in a situation where um, the Palestinian death rate in the Gaza Strip from what are called indirect causes, uh, although they're very direct, hunger, epidemic disease, um, uh, child mortality, and so on, will begin to exceed those appalling numbers that you cited, uh, identifying Palestinians uh, killed as a direct result of is the Israeli aggression against uh, the Gaza Strip. And we've also seen, quite appallingly, um, Israeli citizens protesting aid being moved into Gaza Strip. That's quite shocking for a lot of people to see. So it shows that support for the war in Israel is not just a right-wing thing. It's something that's uh, backed by overwhelming majority of Israeli citizens, um, which in itself is quite shocking given how much devastation we see. I don't think they see the level of devastation and the killing and the destruction that we get to see. 
Well, they, they certainly don't get to see it. And if, if these people did get to see it, I think they'd be very enthusiastic and pleased with, with um, what they would see. You know, these are supposedly Israeli activists um, demonstrating at um, uh, the only crossing um, that Israel is permitting to operate between Israel and, uh, and the Gaza Strip. And this is now being used as yet one more reason uh, for the humanitarian emergency in the Gaza Strip and the inability uh, to, for the entry of humanitarian goods. But, you know, it would take the Israeli military or the Israeli police about 13 seconds to remove these people if it wanted to. I should add, um, Israel and Azerbaijan are extremely close allies, as, as you may know. And um, last year, we saw something very similar um, in Azerbaijan, where activists claiming to be um, uh, environmental activists would go to the Lashin Corridor, which was the only um, connection between Armenia and the Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan, and block it on the pretext uh, that there were mining operations that were uh, damaging the environment. Uh, soon thereafter, um, we saw these people uh, reemerge in, in various uh, government capacities. So, and this is exactly the same, you know, um, uh, Israel and Azerbaijan taking a page out of each other's uh, books. And, and, it really, um, and it really fools nobody. And here again, um, getting back to your previous question, not only has nothing changed in connection with the actions uh, of Israel in the Gaza Strip, but additionally, nothing has changed with respect to um, the statements being made by Israel with respect uh, to the Gaza Strip. Only a day or two after um, the ICJ ruling, um, uh, there was a large Israeli conference attended by thousands in Jerusalem, and the key themes at this conference were the expulsion of the Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, the ethnic cleansing of the territory, and the establishment or reestablishment, as they would call it, of illegal, exclusively Jewish settlements uh, in the Gaza Strip. Now, Yes, you could say um, uh, this is uh, a fringe group, and you would be right um, were it not for one fact. Two of Israel's most senior ministers attended this um, uh, workshop, if you will, um, the Minister of Finance and the Minister of National Security. Um, uh, something like a third of the cabinet was there and more than a tenth of the parliament. So we're not talking about an extremist government. We are talking about a political system. And if you see what's uh, going on in terms of trying to block the crossings and so on, also a society that is increasingly extremist um, uh, beyond redemption. I think the interesting thing here um, uh, is twofold. First of all, that Israel towards the end of this month um, will be either submitting or not submitting uh, it's its report to the International Court of Justice as as required by um, its uh, its ruling. And it will be interesting to see, on the one hand, how the court responds to um, that Israeli submission, which, if I understand correctly, uh, will not be made uh, public. And secondly, how Israel sponsors and allies who are themselves signatories uh, to the Genocide Convention and pursuant to that convention have an obligation to prevent genocide by any other party. It was on this basis that South Africa, in fact, um, initiated its case before the court. It will be very interesting to see how they respond. And thus far, um, uh, the um, approach of of Israel's allies seems to be complicity, complicity, and more complicity. Yeah, let's. Uh, we are waiting that decision, um, but let's stick to Gaza for uh, another question. 
Uh, we spoke in one of our previous conversations about Israeli war aims, and now there's been further doubts put on that. Um, this week, former U.S. <laughs> General Frank McKenzie, who was the commander of U.S. Uh, Central Command, he described Israel's success in its objective in Gaza uh, to date as being very limited. The objective, of course, being the eradication of Hamas. And now there seems to be growing doubts among officials and also experts in the military that this is more or less unachievable. Yes, as as you mentioned, um, uh, General McKenzie was the senior American officer um, responsible for American military operations in the Middle East, um, Central Command. So uh, one presumes that he has at least uh, some idea of um, of what he's talking about, and um, actually, his analysis doesn't really um, require specialized military knowledge uh, to reach a conclusions because um, uh, he looked essentially at um, two issues. Israel's stated aims of um, eliminating Hamas and eliminating its um, uh, leadership and ability uh, to govern the Gaza Strip. And secondly, um, Israel's ability to put forward uh, coherent or indeed any plan uh, for how it wants the situation uh, to develop after its offensive into the Gaza Strip. And on both uh, counts, he found very limited evidence to suggest uh, that um, Israel's campaign is proceeding successfully. None of um, uh, the senior Hamas leaders whether military or political, have been um, located and either um, uh, assassinated or, or arrested. Um, Israel, with its very deeply divided government and political elite, has proven incapable of putting forth any plan uh, for uh, post-conflict uh, post governance in Gaza. And on this basis, he's basically saying, well, if you say this is what you, you're setting out to achieve, and there is absolutely no indication that you have as of yet achieved any of it, then um, my conclusion is uh, that, that you are booking only very limited progress uh, in your war. And I think, you know, all you really need is, um, is, is the uh, technical expertise to read a newspaper. Um, to reach uh, to reach a similar conclusion, I, but you know he could have um, gone further. I think uh, he could have also looked at these reports in the Israeli press and not just in the foreign press that, um, in many respects, Israel is flying blind in the Gaza Strip. It, it, it turns out it in fact has very limited intelligence on um, uh, Hamas on Hamas's military deployment, on Hamas's uh, tunnel network, um, on Hamas's uh, ability to exercise command and control, logistical resupply of its forces, uh, and so on. And bearing in mind, we're not talking about an army here. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, a militia that has developed under intense Israeli, Israeli surveillance uh, for decades. When you look at all those things, the question becomes um, less whether Israel is prepared to invest the blood and treasure to achieve its objectives, but increasingly whether Israel is capable of achieving those objectives, even if it is willing um, to uh, invest um, uh, in terms of lives of its soldiers, economic costs, and, and so on. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, serious military analysts who look at the situation, I think will tell you, yes, Israel has uh, done enormous damage uh, to the Gaza Strip. But if you look at it as a military campaign against a military opponent, well, 
the mere fact that this is now Israel's longest military campaign since 1949 in a postage-stamp-sized uh, postage minuscule territory should really tell you um, uh, all you want to know. And again, one could argue, well, Israel's um, uh, real objective is the ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip. Um, its real objective is an orgy of revenge and, and, and mass death and destruction and so on. Well, that may well be all true, which is why we were earlier discussing um, genocide and the International Court of Justice. But Israel does also have the objective to, if not eradicate Hamas, at least uh, to neuter it. And 120 days in, uh, we really have uh, very little evidence um, that that is going to be achieved. Hmm. And you contrast that with the 1967 war. Uh, Israel won the war in six days, defeated Arab armies, but it cannot defeat Hamas in over 100 days, which I think says a lot. Uh, another, th another topic that's been discussed a lot over the week is a ceasefire deal. Um, Hamas has said that any ceasefire deal in the Gaza Strip must entail complete withdrawal of Israeli forces and lifting of the blockade. And also um, it's demanding reportedly the release of <clears throat> Marwan Barghouti. And I would say Hamas is holding firm on this because um, Israel has been pushed into a corner and it's Israel that needs uh, the US and its Western backers to provide a ladder with which to climb down uh, without losing face. Um, is that part of the reason why Hamas is holding firm on its maximum demand here? Well, I should, I should start by pointing out um, that there's undoubtedly a lot of discussion and, and, and messages being uh, sent back and forth um, behind the scenes and out of the public view. And um, uh, we should take into consideration that there's probably a lot more going on um, than we are aware of. With that caveat in mind, um, let's first look at the public positions. As, as you uh, indicated, Hamas has stayed, Hamas's initial position was um, that it would not even commence negotiations for a further exchange of captives before there was a um, definitive cessation of hostilities, um, before Israel withdrew its forces to uh, the boundaries of, uh, of, of the Gaza Strip, um, and that any negotiations must lead to the end of the Israeli blockade of the Gaza Strip. Israel's position, on the other hand, um, was that it would not countenance any formula that suggested um, a cessation uh, of hostilities as, as opposed uh, to a temporary pause, and that any additional agreement must lead to uh, the speedy release of all remaining captives uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. What seems to be happening is that the Qatari and Egyptian mediators are looking for a formula that on the one hand allows Hamas um, to claim that this war has ended and allows Israel to claim that it has not. Um, this is kind of constructive ambiguity on, the, on steroids. Um, secondly, uh, there are disagreements about um, uh, the, the manner in which any further exchange um, would take place. And third of all, Israel is um, categorically refusing to withdraw to um, the 6th of October boundaries, in other words, to um, uh, withdraw its forces from the uh, entirety of the Gaza Strip. And so, on the one hand, um, we have already seen a climb down of sorts uh, by Hamas in the sense that um, Hamas is claiming that they there is now a general framework that has been put forward to them and that the details of this general framework are now being negotiated. In other words, it's not waiting 
for a conclusive um, end of hostilities first. And on the Israeli side, um, we're seeing, in fact, different um, uh, different noises. You have one faction in the Israeli government and security establishment that wants to um, cooperate with the um, uh, with these uh, proposals, either because the Americans seem to be interested in its implementation and they don't want to uh, sour relations with Washington. Um, or because they're responding to growing Israeli public pressure to prioritize the lives of Israeli captives in the Gaza Strip over the deaths of Palestinian children. Um, and um, uh, third, because there is a, a realization that Israel can continue this war for a very long time and is essentially going to end up in the same position it was in in uh, southern Lebanon in the 1980s and 1990s, where it achieved nothing and was ultimately um, uh, forced to leave. But I would caution against um, uh, the approach that says that the pr fundamental problem here is that Netanyahu needs to choose between either an agreement uh, with Hamas or the perpetuation of his government. And that the reason um, that Netanyahu is, um, uh, is stalling and not coming back with a clear response and so on is because he is primarily motivated by fear that if an agreement is reached and there's even an intimation that the war will either end or be put on pause for an extended period of time, that his governing coalition will then collapse uh, because those who are even more to the extreme right uh, than he is, people like uh, Minister of National Security, Itamar ben Gvir, and Minister of Finance, uh, Bezalel Smotrich, would then leave the coalition. That may be true, but I think we have to understand that there is, in fact, a fairly broad Israeli consensus on continuing this war. And Netanyahu is, I think, a very uh, solid part of that consensus. And not solely, I would argue, not even primarily for reasons that have to do with his um, political longevity. Similarly, you have very senior figures in Israel's uh, security establishment who are averse to any formula um, that basically means they have failed and won't uh, and won't get a um, further opportunity to uh, succeed again. So um, I, I would not look at these uh, negotiations as ones that are going to stand or fall by um, Netanyahu's very narrow calculation about whether it will allow him to uh, remain in office or not. There are much bigger strategic um, issues uh, at play. Yeah. I think what you said is borne out by a number of polls I've seen over the months as well. Israeli society, many within Israeli society believe that the government has gone far enough. So this idea that you can pin all this on Netanyahu, I think, is uh, uh, completely misguided. Um, but I want to know, turn our attention to the region and the big story. Can I just, can I just add one, one point to that? Um, sure. Which is what this polling also demonstrates um, is that if you look at um, uh, the performance of the various Israeli political parties since October 7th, whether those in the governing coalition or those in opposition, virtually all of them are exhibiting um, uh, diminished support. The only clear winner in these polls is the um, Jewish power uh, movement of um, of Itamar Ben Gvir, you know, Kahanist? These are basically um, the Israeli equivalent of, uh, of 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 brown shirts in um, in uh, Nazi Germany. I mean, these these are not just extreme right; these are the extreme of the extreme mm -hmm. right. And and this party has been um, apparently uh, the main beneficiary electorally speaking or at least in uh, in public opinion while well, well, others have seen their report diminish the support diminish yes um 
So I was saying I, I wanted to turn our attention to the regional escalation and the big story from last week is uh, which uh, happened on Friday is the US targeting 85 um, targets in Syria and Iraq uh, as a result of the killing of three US soldiers in Jordan. Um, this again seems like a, another escalation without any clear military goal. Um, I want, I want uh, as you do with these developments, you look to see what do military analysts say. And I wanted to share a quote from an American military retired combat veteran. And I think he kind of hits the nail on the head. Um, so on Twitter, uh, Douglas McGregor, he was um, US Army Colonel, retired Army, Army Colonel, sorry. So he, and I quote him, bombing is not diplomacy. Bombing, bombing is neither a strategy nor a simple exercise in virtue signaling. Bullying, bribing, bombing, and sanctioning opponents has not worked well. Thanks to a string of strategic military failures in Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, and Ukraine, Washington is rapidly reaching hell in its relations with the rest of the world. It's quite an you know, indictment. Yes, and particularly if one looks, um, as this analyst appears to have done, at the record of um, uh, U.S. military force in, in the Middle East, and also consider that um, throughout the past uh, quarter century, um, Joe Biden has been an enthusiastic uh, proponent of these uh, of these campaigns, whether it was uh, the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq, um, you know, going all the way all the way back to Israel's 1982 invasion of uh, of Lebanon, um, and you know, more more recently, other Israeli or American military campaigns in the region, with the exception, I should add, of uh, of Libya. Um, which apparently he had uh, reservations about and, and did not support. But the one person who's never seen a war in the Middle East, he didn't immediately uh, fall in love with, is Secretary of State Antony Blinken. You want to talk hawk? Um, this guy is just absolutely in love with Middle East war. Um, he seems to be almost uh, addicted to it. Um, and then, you know, you take this kind of uh, mindset and you put that in the broader context of, on the one hand, U.S. Uh, policy towards the current crisis, which is essentially one of unqualified support for Israel um, and the principle that Israel alone has the right to international allies and international support and so on, and that the Palestinians um, do not have any right uh, to be uh, supported by any of their friends and allies. You take that on the one hand, and on the other, uh, Biden's view that irrespective of any policy differences that may exist between Israel and the United States, uh, there can be no daylight between them in public. In other words, Israel and the, and the U.S. cannot vote differently at the U.N. The U.S. cannot support any uh, or will not support any resolution that the U.N. Security Council that seek to reduce Israeli impunity or hold it to account for its um, war crimes and crimes against humanity and so on. You take all that together and you end up with a situation that the U.S. has adopted a policy of refusing to compel Israel to observe um, uh, a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip and is instead expanding um, the circle of war in the Middle East by attacking those who are undertaking activities of their own for the sole purpose of reducing Israeli pressure on the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. So you have this um, bizarre situation of 
of the U.S. now conducting um, uh, bombing uh, raids in Yemen, in Syria, and in Iraq on the pretext of seeking to prevent regional escalation. Well, regional escalation is exactly what's being produced. And in fact, um, this is now a full-blown global international crisis, you know, with the UK as always dutifully in tow um, to Washington. So um, I think uh, US uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, he's also refused to rule out an attack on Iran. So we'll have to wait and see, you know, how far the US takes this. Um, yes, and, and, cool. and, there are, and there are those, um, certainly in Israel, um, and to a lesser extent in, in the U.S. as well, um, who, who consider a direct confrontation between the United States and, and Iran the preferred outcome of, of this entire um, uh, crisis. You know, they, they see Iran as a root of all evil. They have difficulty conceptualizing that any of these other parties or peoples may have either agendas of their own or legitimate grievances which they're trying to address. And so you um, get back to uh, this delusional um, uh, assumption that if you can only um, neuter Iran, then all these other problems uh, will disappear. Palestinians will accommodate themselves to permanent Israeli rule. Um, you know, the Syrians uh, will accept uh, Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights and, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yes, that that would really um, uh, lead to an escalation entirely beyond anything that we've seen uh, so far. It would be exponentially um, more cataclysmic. Hmm. One thing that did come as a surprise to a lot of people is uh, Biden issuing an executive order targeting Israeli settlers. So theoretically, uh, US could impose sanctions on Israeli settlers and potentially Israeli politicians and government officials. Uh, don't know what that really means. Um, theoretically, it could do a number of things. Uh, I'd like to wait and see how that pans out. Uh, having read the um, statement or the um, executive order, uh, it, to me, it seemed like Biden still, or the White House is still skirting around the issue and refusing to acknowledge that illegal settlement enterprise uh, would not succeed without the backing of the Israeli government. They seem to be making a distinction between, oh, the settlement enterprise and the government, and there's no connection between the two. The, the settlements have always been part and parcel, it's an arm of the Israeli government, and it, in the state, um, the executive order that doesn't seem to be quite clear to me. Uh, what did you make of uh, the um, executive order? Well, I would make um, two points. Um, the first is that very much like recent um, uh, repeated Israeli statements by Biden and Blinken, you know, that the US supports a two state settlement and is working on a renewal of. Israeli Palestinian and Arab Israeli diplomacy and so on, um, that this is really a diversionary charade, even if you take it seriously. Because at a time when there is a plausibly genocidal campaign being conducted by Israel against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip, and at a time when this plausibly genocidal campaign is possible primarily on account of the unlimited U.S. support to Israel, whether in terms of flying over thousands and thousands of tons of, of high explosives, um, whether in terms of um, uh, ensuring Israeli impunity by um, using its uh, weight and influence um, in, in organizations such as uh, the Security Council to veto resolutions um, that seek to curtail Israeli aggression and so on. At, at, you know, to say in such a context um, that somehow sanctioning four individuals is a meaningful step, um, sorry, no. It really is first and foremost 
a divers diversionary charade. And I think the timing here is important. You know, we had the recent ICJ ruling. Um, we have the growing um, uh, humanitarian catastrophe in the Gaza Strip. And all of a sudden, Washington would like to change the narrative um, to, you know, the heroic uh, initiatives it is taking against um, uh, four individuals uh, who it accuses of, uh, of violence uh, in, in, the, in the West Bank. So that, that would be my first point. The second is exactly um, what you suggested in, in, in your question. You know, it's the bad apples theory of Israeli-Palestinian relations. Um, that, that the real problem here is, is that you have these extremists who we should also understand they're few and far between, um, and that if we can only um, neuter them uh, and, in, and eliminate their influence over Israeli-Palestinian policy, then it will be um, uh, love and peace uh, for, for eternity. In other words, there are no structural issues here. Um, there is no Israeli government agenda going back to 1967 to transform the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip into exactly what they look like um, uh, today. There is no Israeli military which irrespective of um, uh, what you think of, uh, of the settlers and, uh, you know, and these four uh, stormtroopers is the primary agency responsible for everything that has happened in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip since 1967. The settlers are the spearhead of Israeli government policy. Um, uh, they do not operate independently um, uh, of it. Um, the real problems here are the Israeli government, the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, the Israeli military, in other words, the institutions of state that have formulated and implemented these policies and that have armed and financed um, and enabled these uh, settlers who effectively serve as a kind of auxiliary militia of the Israeli state rather than um, uh, independently of it. And thirdly, um, you know, this occupation didn't begin last week. It's been around since 1967. So the message now from Washington is that, you know, we have reviewed everything that's happened in the, in the past 56 years um, in terms of, you know, illegal construction of settlements, illegal annexation, illegal this and illegal that. We have reviewed the record and we have come to the conclusion that the primary problem, well, the primary problem is, of course, the Palestinians um, for not accepting their eternal subjugation to Israel, but that the primary challenge on the Israeli side of the equation is these four bad apples. Really, does anyone in their right mind believe that these measures are going to change anything on, on, on the ground, as opposed to um, uh, real consequences uh, enforced on the Israeli government to change its behavior and end the occupation? So, yes, you can say um, um, this is unprecedented. Um, but that's, that's almost meaningless when you consider that since 1967, neither the United States nor the European Union have imposed any consequences of any sort upon Israel for its dealings with the Palestinian, uh, with the, with the Palestinian people. Um, so to say that um, these uh, measures against four individuals is unprecedented. Well, of course it is. By definition, it is. But that doesn't make it uh, meaningful. And I, if I could just make one more point, you know, many of the most extreme Israeli settlers are in fact American citizens or dual Israeli American uh, nationals, as is often the case. Um, many of these terrorist organizations. Um, fundraise in the U.S. and the U.S. government allows them uh, 
to fundraise by um, uh, allowing American taxpayers to give tax-free donations to these extremist groups and allows American taxpayers um, to designate such financing and funding of, of terrorism against the Palestinian and war crimes, in fact, and crimes against humanity, those are considered charitable donations. So when you give money um, uh, to people who conduct uh, pogroms, uh, who establish illegal uh, settlements, who engage in acts of uh, ethnic cleansing and so on, under American law, that's charity. Hmm. Um, a lot of people will be asking that question. Will he go after Jewish charities which are funding the settlement enterprise? And there are dozens of those who are doing exactly that. And many will be asking, you know, it took a genocide for the Americans to do what they're meant to be doing anyway, which is to stop the illegal settlement enterprise. It's U.S. policy that settlements are illegal, as it is under international law. Um, so um, people will be asking, you know, you only bring in punitive measures against Israel when a genocide is taking place. So that, again, clearly undermines U.S. standing in the eyes of the international community. Uh, another thing that's happened in the U.S. over the past week is the sheer number of uh, civil servants that are expressing their outrage and concern. And this is not just in the U.S., in, in Europe as well. Uh, they're going against the government um, because of its support of Israel. So not only is the public against their governments, now you have civil servants who are going against their government's policy in support of Israel. So which is quite extraordinary um, development, not just in the US, but also here in Europe. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's very significant when you have hundreds of civil servants who, after all, are people who um, earn their living implementing a government's policy, and um, many of whom are um, in one way or another either intimately connected with um, or uh, have, uh, have detailed knowledge of this, of this policy. When they come out and publicly express their opposition to the government's uh, policy, it's not like these people are going into a voting booth um, uh, you know, and casting a secret ballot uh, for a different party. No, these are public statements. And what I find even more telling is that um, uh, this uh, petition or, or open letter of protest was coordinated among civil servants in multiple um, uh, countries namely those that are Israel's sponsors and allies and enforcers. So you had multiple Europeans and um, also uh, from, from the United States. And it's, it's, a, very, um, it's a very stark uh, uh, letter. Um, and these people, you know, despite everything that we're told about the independence of, uh, of, of the civil service and, and so on, um, many of these people will either directly or indirectly, ultimately face um, consequences uh, for taking a stand against uh, genocide. Um, but they, they felt it was vital uh, to do so nevertheless. And I think it's also indicative of the, the changing environment um, in, in the West, in Europe and in, uh, in North America. You know, if you have civil servants who are prepared to put their careers or at least um, uh, their, their future professional development, if you will, on the line um, to express such sentiments, well, what does that tell us about, um, uh, what does that tell us about the broader public opinion in these countries where people are much less restrained um, in expressing uh, in expressing their views because it's not their boss who's implementing the policies uh, they're opposing. And we've seen that also, not just in government, uh, in media as well, CNN yeah. stuff, um, uh, outraged by the fact 
uh, by the line taken by the agency on Israel Palestine, basically saying they are regurgitating Israeli propaganda lines. And of course, it's obvious to those of us who follow this uh, closely. Uh, and also the uh, willingness to question some of the narrative from 7 October within Israel. Harris has been doing a number of amazing reports on that. Um, New York Times pulled a podcast uh, on that very issue um, because there's uh, allegations. It's based on a spurious source, unreliable source, the rape allegations and whatnot. So th there seems to be a willingness to question that, and there seems to be a willingness now to challenge the media narrative, whether it be CNN or, or someone else. Americans um, uh, used to mock Pravda um, and and the Soviet media, and we're now receiving confirmation um, that uh, you know the U.S. and Soviet media are not in fact polar opposites. In in um, in, in in the Soviet Union, um, these people, the media, operated in fear of party and um uh, and and the rulers at cnn apparently they live in fear of the corporations um and their ability to pull advertising revenue and now they also live in fear of mark thompson um the former director general of of the bbc who of course um uh, played a rather pernicious role um, when he was at the BBC and, and redirecting uh, the corporation's uh, coverage to be more sympathetic uh, to Israel and to be um, uh, and to be a better conduit uh, for Israel's version of events. And unfortunately, uh, the results of his work are are being seen today. But um, you know, at at CNN um, and 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 this article by Chris McGreal of The Guardian and chapeau to him for, for having done such a thorough job. He speaks to multiple um, journalists who work or worked uh, at, uh, at CNN. And it's quite clear that, that a lot of people are, are, are very upset um, that their employer uh, and the organization um, with which they're associated has essentially become, in many respects, an adjunct uh, of the IDF spokesperson's office. And, and you know, what, what, what's perhaps particularly um, upsetting here is that there is a long demonstrated, verified history of false claims, of deliberately false claims being made by Israel and specifically um, uh, by by the Israeli military. Yet CNN management um, has decided it was born yesterday and that as a rule, any statement made by Israel about anything needs to be um, uh, treated as credible unless and until proven otherwise. And in addition, that efforts um, to investigate uh, the credibility of Israeli statements and allegations are being severely curtailed. Uh, one last issue I want to ask before we finish our show. Um, the UK, not the government, David Cameron, UK Foreign Secretary, last week said that the UK could recognise a Palestinian state. Uh, what do you make of that? And I mean, Immediately after Labour having said that they will not recognise a Palestinian state until the Israelis do so, they seem to backtrack on that and fearing the conservatives are going to flank them, you know, and it's quite a uh, shocking indictment of them. To me, it just seems like another sign of how both the UK parties and others, I would say, in Europe have become so untethered from any moral and legal principle, uh, which would obviously, if they followed, would lead them to recognise the Palestinian state. Uh, but they, they, they're the ones who seem to be playing, uh, playing football with this issue. And to me, again, that strikes uh, as another example of uh, just playing football. It's not really tethered to anything. Yeah, well, well, several observations. Um, uh, first of all, you know, once again, when it comes to the uh, to Palestine, Keir Starmer 
has decisively um, situated the Labour Party to the right of the Conservatives. Um, uh, secondly, as, as you uh, mentioned, um, Cameron subsequently um, uh, backtracked. And thirdly, I, I would also look at this um, similar to the issue we discussed earlier of U.S. sanctions against um, the grand total of, uh, of four Israeli settlers. You know, at, at a time of genocide, when you're directly complicit in various ways um, uh, in, in these acts, and when you're enabling them in various ways, to then talk about something you may or may not do in the future is, again, ultimately a diversionary charade. What really matters is what choices the UK government makes about what it will and will not do today to address a situation in the Gaza Strip that the International Court of Justice has determined is plausibly a case of genocide, which also means that under the Genocide Convention, the UK government has an obligation um, as a signatory to that convention to uh, prevent uh, genocide from being conducted. And the last observation I would make is, we've heard this all before. You know, the UK, the US, the European Union, um, all these uh, politicians and governments uh, that are now suddenly blathering again about a two-state settlement, well, they've had half a century to make this happen. Um, if one wants to um, uh, consider Oslo a diplomatic process that could have led to a diplomatic uh, solution, well, what have these same states done since 1993 in order to um, in order to promote a Palestinian state? Absolutely nothing. Just talk. They only began formally endorsing um, uh, Palestinian state with much more recently and started hiding behind, well, it has to be multilateral. Um, so, you know, if there's even one government um, uh, that disagrees, we won't do anything. It's it's pure talk. And you take it seriously at your pearl. It's to divert from reality. Um, it's aspirational, uh, which then is used um, as a pretext not to do anything substantive, uh, to bring an end to the occupation. And the real issue, again, um, including in the West Bank, is what is happening on the ground. And if at the same time that you're making public statements about uh, uh, Palestinian statehood and that you may recognize it, if at that same time you are doing absolutely nothing to address what is happening on the ground that is making such a um, uh, outcome impossible, well, then not only shouldn't you be taken seriously, um, uh, you should be, I think, probably correct. So, yeah. If you ignore the situation on the ground, which is moving in exactly opposite uh, direction and leave it at words and aspirations, rather than actions um, that have an impact on reality. Um, well, then your statements may sound nice, uh, but we perhaps uh, shouldn't take them particularly seriously. Thanks, Moin. Um, so that wraps up uh, another episode, conversation. Um, thank you, Nassim. review. Thank mm -hmm. you. So that was my guest, uh, Moin Rabbani. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, see you next week for another episode of Memo Review. Uh, with me, Nasim Ahmed. Goodbye.